The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. What's happening, everyone? Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today live on YouTube. It's Friday. That means we're live. We're coming at you from the, uh, I'd say, the Hoop Ball headquarters. That's where Brew's at. I'm in the Dan Bespris headquarters. That's my bedroom with a sign in the background. Uh, and we are sick as dogs here, but we're getting through it anyway. Uh, I'm Dan oh, Bespris. Oh. They're the, the big dog barking or coughing. Was that a cough or a bark? This is a bark, Dan Bespris. That's what, oh, oh. that's what I thought. That's Aaron Bruski, El Arquitecto. I haven't called you that in a few shows, so I figured I'd dump that back into the mix. Uh, como estas, Arquitecto? What's up, my man? I've been passive-aggressively being mad at you for that. And, uh, <laughs> no, things are good, man. You know, this is a turning point. I love this time of year. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not the hugest Christmas fan. I'll just throw that out there. I feel like the you – know, I'm, I'm a fan of the reason for the season, but not um, the hullabaloo of the season. And it's uh, – it comes to an end at about this time. This week is kind of like a weird little mini vacation, though it's still very busy. We still have a lot of stuff going on. But as we pivot out of December and into January, the fantasy leagues hit full speed. Um, teams, I think, start to play their A games. And, um, you know, a lot of different things sort of get easier. You know, there's not as much craziness on the personal and family side. And everybody seems to get excited about their New Year resolutions, which I will have a few. Um, I don't do the resolution which, thing. What do you have one off the top of your head? Yeah, stop eating like crap. Like that, <laughs> that's basically the resolution. Like, there's no way to dodge the holiday food. It's just impossible to do. So uh, you get in shape, and um, yeah, you know, you just really get going. I, I'm excited about our, our positions on on uh, you know fantasy matters. Our, our teams are strong. You know, got a lot of teams that are competing for titles. So, um, you know, I just kind of want to get on with it. I feel like everything's good. So I'm like, come on, let's just go. Let's get to the end of the season so I can win this stuff. You know, I, I lied. And, uh, I make the same New Year's resolution every year. And every year I do, I think maybe like incrementally one one quantum, one little packet better than the previous year. And that resolution is stay in touch with people a little bit better. But I, I hate Facebook. It drives me totally bonkers. I just think it's the I, worst. I, I thought Shump, I'm in Shumpert, had this just great post today. It was about betting on yourself and social media. But it like social media, I mean, we work with it. We're on Twitter, so it's a little bit different for us. But God, is it toxic. Yeah, it's it, brutal. It, I got this really cool gift, by the way. Um, it's a spire stone, and it tracks your breathing. Those that are regular listeners, they know that I'm big into meditation. And uh, so this thing tracks your breathing all day. Man, the second I get on social media, this thing just starts buzzing me like, dude, you're stressed. You need to chill <laughs> out. And it's it's just the fact that I'm sitting looking at Twitter or Facebook or, you know, whatever it might be. So social media, I'm really hoping that somebody smart out there figures a way to change the dynamic of it so it's not so just ugh. Like, I can't stand yeah, Facebook. Yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. It's uh, it's unusable. I only log on when I'm tagged in something just to see, make sure it's <laughs> like something terrible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you and I, we're, we're on Twitter all day. I think that there's, there's at least like, it, Twitter does bring some small amount of value to the conversation because you get news really fast on it. And so that makes it a, a useful tool. Facebook has dumped what made it useful, which was keeping up with the people you actually care about. Now it's just... Anyway, it, it does. It's it's stressful, and we don't need to get into that because we're both like fighting illnesses and start the show by getting all mad. Uh, it's fantasy NBA today live on Friday at Dan Bespers at Aaron Bruski. If you want to give us a follow on the aforementioned Twitter, of course, this is a hoop ball presentation, and as you can see on your uh, computer screen or smartphone device, there's a little logo on the bottom right corner of our feed. That's from our presenting sponsor, the title sponsors here of all of our shows at Hoop Ball, Hawaiian Isles, Man, Kona Coffee. saviors. Yeah, they're keeping brew awake. I am uh, not a massive caffeine drinker, so it's I just fall asleep, and I just desperately wish that I could properly digest caffeine because I, too, would be revved up on Hawaiian Isles, Kona Coffee right now. Instead, I basically just have to like mainline a pixie stick to stay awake. <laughs> that's my... 
that's my go-to move is like Where, where'd you learn how to mainline dan Berkeley? <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about i just swallow the pixie stick through my mouth it proceeds through my digestive system as normal uh the the topics du jour i took a moment and, and i'm trying to i'm trying to do a better job brew of getting the like the really important stuff but it's also kind of a weird week uh i think this is going to be a quieter show would be my guess just based on the fact that we're stuck between christmas and new year's right now uh merry christmas by the way brew and happy new year to everybody listening as well um so i got some topics and i think that they're kind of big ones and so I, i'm what i'm going to say right here at the outset is we're going to do questions, but it's probably going to be more like 20 minutes of them instead of 30 or 35. So if you have one, get it in soon, uh, because I don't think we're going to be doing like a 50-question lightning round at the end either. I, I got some big topics, and I want them covered. So, Brew, you ready to launch into some of the big stuff? As always, sir. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I like to hear. Big stuff number one, Luke Cornett. How about Cornet. that? Cornet. Corn, Cornet, Dan. Oh, yeah, Luke Cornet. <laughs> nah, I don't know. A, to quote the great Mad TV, that's a French ass name. Uh, Luke Cornett. What what do we make of all? Okay, so there's there's a few things to break down on this, right? Uh, Ennis Cantor was getting roasted on the defensive end. Mitchell Robinson is out, and then Cornett came in and just went yakko yesterday. How does this whole thing play itself out? Because there's a part of me that's like, this is intriguing, but there's another part of me that's like, well. You know, Mitchell Robinson's a guy that's going to get some minutes. And is Canner presumably a guy they're looking to move? How do you think this whole thing, how does this dynamic shake out over the next month or two? You kind of got to go with what we know here so we can wrap our heads around this because I'm sure a lot of people are like, who the hell is Luke Cornett? You know, they don't know anything about this guy. Um, what we do know is that when he gets minutes, he produces. And his numbers last year, um, in really limited action, but not that limited to where you just ignore it. We're, we're very good. So I think if he gets minutes, he's producing just bar none. So that, that, that's just a really interesting dynamic because if you have a player like that, why aren't they playing in the first place is the first question that you ask. Um, but he is more of a, he's just a stat friendly player. So that's going to be basically, um, you know, the question that the Knicks have to answer for themselves right now. And they have Mitchell Robinson and a guy that they've put a lot behind already. I mean, they gave him a starting job and he hasn't really taken the ball and run with it. And now he gets an angle in from an ankle injury that is really sort of shrouded, I guess, in mystery. We don't know exactly when he's coming back. Um, it might have been of the high variety. And so what happens now with Luke Cornett is he gets a shot at producing. So if he can be productive and he can really take this decision to David Fisdale and the Knicks and force the hand, you could see the Knicks saying, hey, Mitchell Robinson, let's get you some time in the G League. You know, let's let's rehab you up. And, and you see this sort of extended timeline get even more extended, which is really interesting for folks that made a huge waiver wire play in free agent acquisition budget leagues where they, they bid 50, 60, 70% of their, their budget on this guy. And now you have a player in Cornet that might render that uh, investment uh, obsolete. I, I think you got to add Cornet in almost any situation where you have a top 125 or below player that doesn't have a lot of upside or for whatever reason is a flawed asset just to try to get in on that. Uh, if he was to somehow be a 25 minute guy for the Knicks. And, and you have the Cantor stuff lingering in the background where Cantor and the organization don't always see eye to eye. He's constantly, you know, tweeting stuff. He's not happy with coming off the bench. They're sort of messing with his contract season. It was a relationship of convenience in many ways to start this season out. So I, I think that, you know, you could see very easily Cantor, you know, it's hard to see him getting dealt, but you could see him exiting stage left for whatever reason, whether that be to protect his free agency, whether that be just due to a minor injury or, you know, the team not being happy with what he's doing for whatever reason. And then you see Cornet and Mitchell Robinson playing, but cornet has got enough little paths to value here where I think you just got to take a chance on it. Now, 
am I dropping a top 100 guy to get him? Hell no. So he's, he's on the, he's firmly on the radar with some upside. You got to be willing to take a risk. I, I don't know if he's a must own player, but I'll tell you these guys that, that fit this profile, they're kind of must own players in any competitive league, no matter what, because you're always looking for something that can get up over top 100 and with his stat set and with his various talents and with his track record, he checks all of those boxes. Hmm. So I, I'll call him a must own player. Um, but, but you got to have people in your league that are willing to take those risks. So one of the things that I tweeted last night, and I and I, I might do it given depending on how time works today. Maybe if the kid naps on me, I can throw a few offers out there. I thought I might take a guy like Luke Cornick coming off this massive game yesterday and package him. I picked him up in uh, basically every league that I'm in. Uh, as he was going nuts, I picked him up in all of these leagues. He's a guy that, to me, because he's such a shiny toy right now, could actually fetch something interesting on the trade market. I thought maybe I'd throw him in with like a fifth rounder and ask for a third or a fourth rounder back, one of those little incremental bumps, because I always love having a a revolving roster spot on my team. Would you rather hold and see if he can hit top 75, or would you rather move him as a shiny toy that could potentially help upgrade one of your guys into one of those difference maker categories? Of those two directions, with which fork in that road would you take? Well, I think you've done a great job highlighting why you probably shouldn't play in a fantasy basketball league with Dan Bespris. I'm a madman. This, this, well, this is that's a pro move. And two for one trade offers are, to me, almost insulting. <laughs> well, they are because people do know, them so poorly. People are like, all right, well, here's two top 100 guys. Give me a top 50 guy back. That's an awful way to make a two for one. What you should be trying to do is take like a top 60 guy and a super shiny toy and ask for a top 50 guy back. You should be trying to upgrade your guys one round at a time. And that's not insulting. That's like, listen, hey, here you go. You're going to take a little bit of a hit with this guy I'm giving you. But hey, maybe this other guy works out and maybe you win this trade. What I find that is like I'll get these two for one, three for one offers and nobody's even looked at my roster to see that there are no players that you could drop. You know, so it's whatever. That's 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 my own shop talk with my own teams. Uh, I think that's a great move. I think that anytime you can liquidate value out of a, a situation where it's extremely questionable, you're really just there's it's all upside and no downside. You've increased the value of your squad without having to take on any of that risk. So I think that's an absolutely strong way to do that. Um, you know, I probably want to hang on to the asset, you know, in a vacuum, you know, if the deal's not great, it's, I mean, Cornet just has a sweet fantasy stat set threes blocks, you know, active, you know, willing to shoot and score, you know, the history of putting up numbers. You know what I'm also excited um, about, by the way, on this one is with Cantor moving out of the starting lineup, Cornet moving in is actually awesome for Noah Vonley. It's a weird, like adjunct thing because Corda doesn't get anywhere near the basket, and you saw it in yesterday's game. Vonley is going to grab every rebound on the planet as long as he's logging starters minutes at power forward. That's a nice little side bonus. He got dropped in a bunch of leagues like last month when he was just sort of coasting along at like top 110. This could actually give him a round or two bump because no one's taking those O-Reebs and little chippies away from him anymore. Yeah, it, you know, Vonley has been great. He's taken a step forward as a player and playing with a guy that's light on the rebounds because he can't get to the to get to the rebound. That's only going to help him out. He's been a top 100 guy easily. He's going to probably move into the top 80 range, and and that's a must own player. Hmm. Uh, kind of reminds me of um, Nemanja Bjelica as far as the numbers, you know, pan out. He's a top 100 guy that's you know bumping himself up to a top 80 guy. Both of those guys I see on way too many waiver wires, and uh, you know, absolutely. Yeah, you know, Vonley is a really, really nice story that's gotten not that much pub this year. I, I mean, I know, I know, really respected basketball people that really thought that guy had no future in the NBA whatsoever. Now he's out there. I saw him do a like a uh, triple crossover between the legs, dribble into a fadeaway jump yeah, shot. Yeah, it was amazing, dude. Uh, he's I, going coast to coast like once a game right yeah. now. I just was like, yeah, you know, go for it, man. You you actually are learning how to play basketball. And with the physical profile that 
that plays and he's he's just been great this year so you know hats off or, or beanies off yeah and he blocked Giannis twice in that last ball game. i mean the rest oh of- yeah i actually yeah I, I put the film out on that that was just a great move and it really highlights how Giannis can be shut down in the playoffs i think a lot of people are you know riding the bucks and, and talking about them like they're the next best thing and obviously Giannis is great but i've been so anti him putting on muscle and he looks like he's shooting it with like a shot put out there yeah shot's and- terrible it, it the shot so basically Von Lay sat on it and he was able to easily react and just pummel that 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 drive to the hoop and and it was really one of the most um it was the most uh just aggressive blocks that I've seen on Giannis in some time yeah uh kudos to Von Lay, man and playing a guy twice in a row I guess you get a little bit of like experience on top of film but uh played him about as well as anybody has this year Next thing on the docket, and uh, we're going to go to Phoenix because this is – I'm having fun with the stuff this week. I think we've had some kind of I'm fun – I'm a fun st- fan. Yeah, this has been a fun week for, for some of these fantasy stories we've been sitting on for a little bit. Uh, Kelly Oubre's looked good. Mikael Bridges has looked good. Josh Jackson has looked less good. Is that about where we're sitting with this team? And what I've been telling people on the podcast myself, and I'd love to – either get confirmation from you or maybe we could switch it up is Ubre and Bridges should both be owned and Jackson is more of a points league guy. Uh, anything to add on top of that? I'm just so thrilled that I held on to Bridges through all of that because there are days where it looked bad. Yeah, it looked real bad. <laughs> and I mean, I just I'm a believer in the player and the the shooting stat set and, you know, the money counters and the whole bit. And what happened amazingly i mean this deal almost got scuttled over marshawn brooks or yeah. dylan brooks i mean <laughs> they the, the sons are not, they're not smart they're not they're not where you want them to be yet but they accidentally luck into kelly Ubre. and by the way hats off to the memphis grizzlies for screwing that up I mean, kelly Ubre is this dynamic player who really like you know i i, I throw this out there not don't don't listen to me on this but like Kind of like Kawhi Leonard in the sense that Kawhi didn't really have all of the tools that he has right now, but he had the athleticism and then he was able to develop the tools. And you look at Kelly Oubre and he's in the same light as as that. Like if he can just develop a much smoother offensive game, they're really on to something. But as it stands right now, he's got great defensive ability. He can shoot. You know, he's he's basically able to do straight line drive stuff. And, you know, he, he's really for what they they need. He's really good. And what has happened bringing him in is it's now balanced out their roster. They took out Trevor Ariza, who was a low key chucker who literally every time he got the ball, tried to dribble drive into something that wasn't there. And it it just sort of fed this culture of, I got to get mine. I got to get mine. And what Devin Booker has done coming back is he's been a little bit more judicious with his shot selection. Not a lot, but you've seen guys like Josh Jackson, sort of maybe understand their role a little bit. Maybe this trade was able to refocus the team in, in terms of their understanding of what their, their roles are. Um, now they're balanced. Uh, you even look at like Aiton and Rashawn Holmes. These two are rooting for each other like crazy. Hmm. You know, they got real good chemistry on this squad. TJ Warren is shooting lights out and they've, they've gone away from things like Ryan Anderson. They didn't keep Austin Rivers. I mean, so now they're balanced and – I think what's crazy about this is is the number 15 team in the West. They, if I had to say who could be the number eight team in the East. Yeah, they could probably do it. I think they, I mean, even like if we just reset the season and started it from now, like I would be very tempted to put them, you know, right behind the nets as, as the like seven and the eight slots. And they're just good. Like, so congrats to the Western conference for having all 15 teams be compelling right now. <laughs> what a gaunt- and, uh, what a gauntlet though. Good Lord. It's a gauntlet and you know, they're going to lose more games as a result of being in the West, but like, yeah, I mean, so yeah, Ubre should be owned. Bridges should be owned. Rashawn Holmes should be owned. Like th- this is now a fun fantasy team when in the past it's just been a total blank show. And, uh, that's good because I watch a lot of Suns basketball and I prefer to watch good basketball, not bad. Fair enough. Next stop on our tour de force is Miami. And this one's a little bit less fun, honestly, because uh, we're getting into the log jam territory again. What well, life was good in Miami when guys were out, when Whiteside was out, it was things were clearer up front. 
uh, when half of the guards were out, things were clearer in the back. Uh, now you got basically everybody besides Goran Dragic is playing. And I know there's the Dion Waiters thing, but they're gonna he's going to be brought along slowly, so I'm not worried about that yet. Uh, in the post-Dragic surgery era, if you want to call it that, and he wasn't playing a ton even before he finally went under the knife, we've seen uh, a heavy dose of Tyler Johnson. We've seen a surprisingly heavy dose of James Johnson lately. We've seen still Dwayne Wade getting his 24 minutes and just chucking away. The farewell tour continues there. And then you've seen, unfortunately, with Justice Winslow coming back, kind of a phase out of Kelly Olynyk and Derek Jones Jr. What kind of a leash? I'm going to start. I have a couple questions on the heat for you, Brew, but I'm going to start with those guys. What kind of a leash do you give Olynyk, Bam, and Derek Jones Jr.? Because for me, you know, I'm a wheeler and a dealer, so I'm basically punting after one more bad game. Should I be holding on longer? Uh, well, you know, I, I think the... The Heat, I'm actually encouraged by right now because Justice Winslow has found a role that is good for him. And they, I think they believe in him as almost like their point guard of the future right now. Goran Dragic has not looked good for over a year now. Um, just inconsistent, lack of explosion, inability to really get the the Heat into things that they want to get into. So be interested to see how they handle that, if there's trades that are made, if they really want to go all the way with this Justice Winslow thing. I mean, as a player he's so oddly created you know the the the, he's not a shooter by any means obviously um so theoretically you want him to play like power forward (laughs) so he can you know that that level of shooting he provides could actually be an asset to you um obviously undersized in that role but strong enough to make it at least a credible idea now you move him all the way across the spectrum to point guard and he's now in a place where he can now use that same strength against smaller point guards. And his whole MO out on the floor is to get into the lane, use that physicality. And it's what's really gotten him into trouble with this team is trying to do too much. And it's one of those things that you can't really just look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's the thing that's that's killing this team. But so many players... And, and, you know, such a crowded rotation. If you have one player that's doing things that are gumming things up, it really throws the whole team into whack. So now they've sort of accidentally or by, you know, virtue of injury fallen into this this place where now you move him to point guard and I think it might work out for them. So what does that mean? It means somebody like James Johnson might be able to hang on to a top 125 value, which isn't making or breaking a fantasy team. This isn't time to run out and add James Johnson. But if you need a forward, if you need the stats that he provides, you know, I do think, yeah, he's definitely an option. One thing that worries me about it is he still doesn't look athletic. Um, but he's, he's getting a little bit better in that department. The, the locals, you know, probably about five, seven days ago said that he just didn't look athletic at all. And they've sort of changed their tune in the last couple of days saying he's getting a little bit better, but they still need him to do more. So I don't think there's a lot of belief locally within the team that this is some sort of a transition for James Johnson. It's just that they're happier with him now. Um, You got Hassan Whiteside out there dealing with a hip injury. He's going to play in this one tonight. He looked bad in the last game, but still got 16 points, 12 boards, uh, three blocks, 31 minutes, something like that. And that was, you know, that's good for him. But I think you also get a chance that uh, he either plays low minutes or aggravates his injury. And then you start to see Kelly Olenek get back into his normal role. And I think the team has learned, I'm pretty sure they know that they're better with Kelly Olenek and Bam Adebayo than they are with Hassan Whiteside in most situations against most teams. I don't think they're really ready to concede that Hassan Whiteside is somebody that they don't want to have around because they do go to him at times, especially when they need buckets and they're able to, you know, be better with him than when they're when they're without him. The problem is that that's only about twenty percent of the time. So this team is morphing, and I know, th- I, and I, th- I'm, I, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I know that they think they have something in Derek Jones Jr. as well. So you see the outlines of this stuff. Dion Waiters coming back is extremely worrying from a lot of different levels. He could just throw this thing out of whack. So you, you're not just hard betting on the Heat, saying this, this is going to work, that they're going to turn the corner on this stuff. But I do like, I got Derek Jones Jr. In a lot of places, I, unless I'm absolutely forced to, I don't want to get rid of that guy. There's too much upside there. 
too much physical potential and with all those money counting stats and the ability to be a rebounder as well and score, you know, I, I, I think there's a ton of upside there. So I think Winslow should be owned. Olenek, I'd like to hold and see how this goes for the next couple of days. And then Derek Jones Jr. He's a luxury stash. Don't get me wrong. You know, this isn't going to break out anytime soon, but the, the Heat have a funny way of making players that they like get the minutes that they want when they want. You've seen it with Josh Richardson. You've seen it earlier in the year with Rodney Magruder. If that spin of the wheel lands on Derek Jones Jr. and then it just sits there, I think that folks would be really upset that they passed on top 75 value. A couple of names that I'm going to throw at you here. Uh, one of them is the newest Houston Rocket, and that's Austin Rivers. What are you? What have we seen from his first two games? He's played 60 minutes, which is not nothing. Yeah, I mean, so minutes, uh, I, th- I think I've seen you tweet about this, and it's basically what I feel too, is that he's going to get more touches per minute than um, than he is getting right now. And when you're a new guy on the team, especially this kind of a team, you just sit in the background. You take the shots that are presented to you. You don't force anything. And there will be a point in time where they go to Austin Rivers and they say, hey, we need you to be a little bit more aggressive because we really, you know, as much as we enjoy watching James Harden dribble out the shot clock every time and then make a three, you know, they probably don't want James Harden doing that all regular season long uh, in order to save him for the playoffs. So um, I think his shots per minute will go up. His minutes will obviously come down a little bit when James Ennis and Chris Paul return. I don't think he goes lower than 25 minutes. Is that enough to give him late round value? It's it's probable. I would say it's probably about 60%, 70% chance that he, he could do that at 25 minutes. So I think he could be better than that, obviously, if you know attrition hits and, and injury strike and they um, have to uh, go to Austin Rivers more than they would like to. But uh, I, I'm comfortable calling him a late-round value. You know, whether or not I want to like, you know, see this out at the expense of a higher upside player. Uh, you know, A good example of two different team builds where two different players would be worth two different things. You know, if you're a team that's trailing in the standings, that you're having injury issues on a weekly basis or day-to-day basis, I'd rather have Austin Rivers than Derek Jones Jr. If I'm cruising in first place and I got plenty of depth, there's no question in my mind I want Derek Jones Jr. So, uh, you know, he's a, Austin Rivers is a lower upside asset with a decent chance of having late-round value. The other name I wanted to mention is we mentioned him as kind of like a deep leaguer, but he had a really good game last night, and that's Mo Harkless. Uh, is he creeping onto the radar for 12 teams yet, or are we still a little bit away from that? You know, he's creeping and he's creeping and he's creeping. <laughs> um, I like that. Very good. I try. You know, I, I did took his, up rapping for like a month. Did did and, Mo Harkless's beeper keep beeping by any chance? <laughs> Don't think I didn't listen. Well, he, to he's that. trying to make his impression felt. Oh, very you know, good. Um, <laughs> How far can we go in the song without saying a word I, I, we're not allowed to I say? I don't know. Yeah, I, I do. Should I pop some allergy meds and and let's just really get down? <laughs> yes. Don't do drugs, kids. Don't, Don't do, do drugs. So he had eleven and eight with two steals, two blocks, and a three pointer. He's he's this weird three and D guy that actually can do it on decent percentages, but he's <laughs> got to be out there for thirty minutes though, and that's only happened twice over the last six games. Yeah, he has to get the thirty minutes, but in a nine cat league, especially, he has a lot of wiggle room. Um, for him, I think it's mostly about health, and so what we see are kind of two steps forward and one step back. And that's not going to be good enough. Yeah, not quite for yet. fantasy value. But but I, I think that you know in a nine cat league, he's got a pretty good shot at being a late round value. I'd probably put it right now at about fifty percent. So if that is something that would help you out, you're in a twelve to fourteen team league. You got injury issues. Maybe you're just looking for a player that can pump up your money counting stats. He's definitely worth a look. Last thing on my list, and then we'll get to some questions. The Washington Wizards. John Wall in and out of the lineup seemingly every other day. Otto Porter's been missing in action for two weeks. Jan Mahimi fouled out and got 27 minutes in their last ball game. Uh, what's going on out there? Jan Mahimi is really important because whatever he can play, I think that Scott Brooks wants to... He, Scott Brooks played Kendrick Perkins in actual meaningful basketball games. Nobody should ever forget that. And nobody's ever gone and said, hey, that was a dumb thing. You know, so I don't think that Scott Brooks has been rehabbed from, from the veteran, <laughs> you know, teat, if you will. Hmm. It's, um, 
so but that's big because you know uh thomas bryant is a guy that i own all over the place and had the huge game last week i mean what was it like 31 and 13 or something yeah, on a perfect 13 for 13 shooting i think also right uh, you're starting to hear the locals in washington they, they want him on the floor more he's a really interesting player he's kind of a a, a stretch five but Still does stuff on the drive, obviously. He was rolling into the hoop like it was nobody's business and um, shoots a good free throw. And he's uh, you can tell the athleticism and the talent's just not quite there. Um, but who knows? I mean, where things have happened in this league? You don't want to you – know, it's that whole money ball thing because he, he's kind of stocky. You know, he doesn't have that classic athletic NBA player build, and I think people will discount him as a result of that. Um, but if Mahimi can't play, which is, is is usually the case with with Jan Mahimi, it opens things up for Thomas Bryant considerably. And in this upcoming game tonight, they don't have John Wall. Markeith Morris is doubtful. You're going to see a lot of Tomas Sadaransky. You're going to see Jeff Green probably play 40 minutes. Green's the guy that's getting all the minutes. He's a top 115 value must own player. Um, so I, I don't think that it, um, there's any question about whether or not Jeff Green should be owned. Sam Decker is like right out of the Scott Brooks handbook. So, I mean, watch for him to get big minutes in this one tonight. Uh, Otto Porter's knee thing is very worrying. Um, you you kind of now get a little bit of insight as to why they might have been going after Trevor Ariza so hard, why they give up Kelly Oubre is a story for another podcast, but you know, this team I think is going to transform. I think it's going to become Bradley Beal's team. I think Trevor Reza, you know, as a Scott Brooks guy, as a 40 minute per game guy, possibly <laughs> is going to be a must start player. Um, Sadoransky is the guy that you want to get your money on when you can. Um, because if anything happens with John wall, who was called sick for um, the pre Christmas day game, and was sitting there, <clears throat> pardon me, just slapping five with teammates on the bench, swapping all those germs left and right. It was really, really just like, <laughs> how's this guy ill if, you know, he's sitting there contaminating the rest of your team? Now he's out with a heel injury. He doesn't look good health-wise. So he could go down, it feels like, at any point in time. He's been plenty productive for fantasy leagues with top 25 value in eight-cat formats, top 60 and nine-cat if you draft him in a nine cat, you're probably losing there. Um, but I think this team changed. The team's ready for it to be Bradley Beal's team. Um, the question is, is you know, does Markeith Morris stay above water? I think if he's healthy, he does. Uh, but Thomas Bryant's the one that that's really intriguing because he's the guy that if they just cut him loose and say, all right, you're our center now, we're going to give you 25 minutes per game, he can get top 100 value. And heaven forbid they go all the way up and give him like 28 minutes per game, something like a la Clint Capella, his first real breakout year with Houston. He could be a top 75 guy. So I've, you know, I've kept Thomas Bryant through all this stuff. Um, you know, he had a little bit of an off game in this last one, but uh, how that all plays out will uh, be of great interest to not just me, but, you know, folks that are also adding Thomas Bryant. Hey, a uh, question for you, Brew. When the new year turns, does the in-season premium membership hit a special of any kind? <laughs> I put balls well, I on teams. Play. That's what I do. Yeah, I, just... know, I was going to say, we're playing T-ball, and I really appreciate that. T-ball was a fun game for me as a mm -hmm. youth. Um, yes, we, we do have a promo. Right now, we're, we're in the middle of promo right now. It's Christmas week special. It's $5 off for the premium product. So it is $14.99, which is an amazing price. Uh, Birdie on my shoulder you know, told me, that there might be a promo to start off the new year. Mm. So, you know, we're all about promo. There's that. There's the DraftKings sponsorship, which is great. Uh, there's the DFS contest tonight. That's I'm right. looking to get my revenge on you, Dan. That's right. I won. Good for me. Now, I didn't win win. I mean, I got ninth place, but I won money, and that's cool. You know, I'm going to kick your ass tonight. There's so many weird choices that are about to happen with John Wall out and Paul George out. Uh, there are going to be some interesting roster decisions to make. This is where the pros take our money, isn't it? Yes, it is. This is where we're going to get. <laughs> this is where we're going to get steam train. Uh, I I, I want to. You know what? I, I'm going to call my shot right now. I'm going to quit season long at some point in my career. Just yeah. go all DFS. I, I, I said it, and I'm I'm gonna, I'm going to just. You know, it's like Michael Jordan wanted to take up baseball, right? Yeah, he you got know, he got uh, as high as double A though. Let's not forget that. 
I'm, I'm going all the way, Dan. <laughs> You're going, going all the way. And yes, I did refer to myself as Michael Jordan. You, were, If you were don't, the Michael Jordan. Don't just of, gloss over that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you've said crazier things on the podcast. I'm, I'm stuck on the idea that if you were Michael Jordan on season long and you're taking up DFS, which is your baseball, what is double A level DFS? You're going to be like consistently double, double a dfs that's a <laughs> that's a brand new burgeoning website that's yet to be created yeah double a dfs that's where brewski's uh career is gonna gonna max out hey you know what i learned about our contest from mike on uh, yesterday's podcast that you can actually now that they expanded the room to 100 spots you can actually make multiple lineups for the contest <laughs> did you know that that's cool because you know here's the thing i didn't like, know that the, the, the multiple lineups and all of these tools that we're looking to develop here at hoopball are just i mean like that's the name of the game like and oh man you gotta have multiple lineups because you you gotta have you gotta have your chips on all sorts of different players so they don't bust out you know you don't bust out an entire lineup because one guy has the crap night you know that's that's where the pros are at you know they're, they're they're working the angles they're doing stuff like you're doing with the gaming picks you know yeah you got to track it you got to figure out what's going on you know mike was telling me on yesterday's show too that the best way to do that when you're working multiple lineups is to do basically like a double swap where if you have one lineup then your second lineup you do two guys so two different positions potentially and that way you kind of give yourself a new uh bucket of players to work from for each of those two spots i don't know i think i might stick with one in this one but i just it was kind of cool to find out you could do it and you can win with both. If both of your lineups are inside the top ten, then you know each three dollar buy in turns into thirty bucks. You could end up winning sixty dollars in this con. You could do three. You could win ninety bucks. Yeah, I've, I've I've humble bragged a little bit today on Twitter. Um, you know, just talking about that. I'm in Shumper tweet and and how happy that I am that I work here at Hoopball. Um, back in the day, we I won this fantasy football contest. It was a big prize, thirty grand. Uh, thank you, Larry Fitzgerald, for everything that you've done for me and my family. <laughs> um, the the systems that that we used or that I used there were, <clears throat> you know, it, you had all these players that you were picking from. How do you pick between these thirty players that you like? You know, you really got to have a system, and and that's what I think separates guys like Mike Patria from. You know, somebody like myself. Yeah, I'm just pointing and me. clicking. I look at this thing for like an hour and a half, and I and I play out all these different matchups in my head, and I point and I click. And uh, obviously, that's why he's the pro and I'm not. Yeah, we th- we're in a good spot with the contest because I think there's a lot of folks at Hoop Ball that like us are are more season long e, and so we're kind of figuring out DFS together, and it's good. It creates a, a fairly fair room. But if you got like the real pros into that room. Along with Mike, if if there were a bunch of ringers in there, we'd just be getting absolutely swarmed it, every week. It'd be awful. But we don't. We have a lot of folks that are learning together. We're figuring out how to you know, track injury news and find out what a good deal is. And I learned what the term chalk meant because, for me, a gambling guy, it always just meant laying a heavy favorite, basically. Uh, and that's not the same thing in DFS. So anyway, uh, get into that contest. We're, we've been tweeting out the links all day. Uh, Brew, you've been retweeting stuff. I've been retweeting stuff at Aaron Bruski, at Dan Vespers, at Hoopball Fantasy. And, and I said this last time, but I'll say it again. If you'd like to get an email alert when we open these contests, let me know. I'll be happy to add you to the email list. That way you don't have to watch Twitter all day and wait for the link to come out. I'll just send it straight into your inbox. Questions from the chat room. I know this is what you guys have been waiting for, so we'll segue into that now. Uh, and we've got, let's see, what's the clock show? Yeah, we've got about 20 minutes. 20 minutes of questions. I think we're in pretty good shape here. Brew, we ready to roll? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Strap on your safety belts. Keep your arms and legs inside the automobile. And off we go. Uh, CP says, thoughts on Jonathan Isaac. He was dropped in my standard league. Tantalizing upside, mediocre output. Is he worth dropping Rashawn Holmes for? Ooh, that's where the question took a turn, didn't it? Um, I mean, I'll admit, Brew, I'm sitting on Isaac where I where I drafted him, but it has it hasn't been easy. Mm, that's a great question. I mean, and these are the these are the the questions that win and you know make you win or lose your fantasy leagues. I would say this um, as it stands right now, I would rather have Jonathan Isaac, and I'm the biggest Rashawn Holmes guy there is on the internet. I'm pretty sure. So uh, <laughs> the reason reason being is his path to upside is not attached to a guy named DeAndre Ayton 
his path to upside is that magic team finally saying, okay, we're done with Aaron Gordon initiated offense and we're done with whatever the hell else we're doing. That's not optimizing a Jonathan Isaac. It, it's, it's really about pecking order with NBA teams. A lot of the time, there's some unofficial passing of the torches that occurs with, um, you know, players and you see Isaac's, you know, impact on games dropping. I, I feel like the magic will want to come to the rescue here and sort of force his role, you know, start to, to even like bench guys if they don't get him involved. So that to me puts him at that top 80 range, which is where you want him at. And uh, that, you know, as much as I love Rashawn Holmes, you know, he really does need Aiton to get hurt or for them to start playing together in order to get out of his current sort of top 100 to 125 build. Hmm. Next one on the docket uh, from our same friend. This is similar question about James John. Oh, well, we talked about James Johnson a little bit. Uh, you said 100 to 125 range for James, if I recall from earlier in the show. That That's not where I, w- I want to predict him to be, but I think that's where his upside sits. Ah, okay. So if I want to predict him, I'll probably go top 140, but you know, that's um, it's a fairly narrow range of outcomes, I would say. You know, top one twenty five to top one sixty. You know, in his current position. So, obviously, the one sixty doesn't cut it, but you know, top one twenty five does. What do you think about Karis Levert and or Nico Miritich's current injuries? One of these guys getting back. I think January is in play for Karis Levert. He is, hmm. um, you know. Sort of, I, I've done some deep dives on both of these players. Actually, I've got Miritich everywhere, and I've got Karis Levert stash in a very important league. And so he is, um, you know, he's meeting all of the criteria for a guy that could return in January. They're going to be in a playoff push, and I think that that's going to, you know, keep them from taking a very safe. You know, though they will be safe with him, I think they're going to be more aggressive than they would if they were not in a playoff push. So I think January is in play. Um, Miritich, you know, New Orleans has been an injury news just um, dump for for years. And so uh, it really feels like he has a high ankle sprain. You know, no updates, no nothing from anybody. I've looked everywhere. You can't find anything that's really good. All we know is that he himself asked out of action and – that's not typical for him. He, he he's usually a guy you've got to kind of save from himself. So um, I, I also think that they want him to play. That's the other. Yeah, they need him. They need him because they're tr- desperately trying to keep Anthony Davis as the league has converged on Anthony Davis to try to rip him out of New Orleans. So, I mean, the fact that he can't play right now as is is really indicative of a serious injury. And of course, in New Orleans, they treat it like it's day to day. So we don't get anything. Um, I don't think he's playing next week. Mm. Is, that's my gut. That's what I'm planning for, is for him to not play this this upcoming week. So if he can get out there and get me a game or two next week, just so I know I can use him the following week, I'm a happy guy. But this has been a big – it's been brutal, and it's, it's hurt teams because of the way it's been reported. And, and these teams that, that are out there that do it like this in these smaller markets, you know, they, they really just, I think – I, I don't know what kind of a disservice they're doing to anybody other than fantasy and, and gaming, you know, folk, but it's it's not cool. It's not cool, damn it. Not cool. Uh, Mitchell Robinson question. We talked about him right at the outset of the show. Uh, do you think he can get himself into that, into like a 20-minute role at, as the season wears on? I mean, that that's that was the original, and that's the original plan, and you got a guy in Scott Perry that's running a lot of the show there that – when he wants a guy to play, he makes sure that he plays, you know, and F- how Fizdale fits into all that is pretty hilarious. So, you know, Fizdale is a guy that will change with the winds, you know, he'll have one starting lineup one day and then he'll just be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I didn't like it. So we're going to mm-hmm. go this way. Not extremely good from a stability and a coaching perspective, but you know, it's, it's his show. So, you know, what are you going to say? Um, so he could change, you know, from an original position that I want Mitchell Robinson getting these 15 to 20 minutes per game. And like we discussed earlier in the show, give him none. If Luke Cornett ends up pushing him, he could, you know, bench Ennis Cantor. There are a lot of different ways this could go. I think you got to hang on. The guy's capable of getting six or seven blocks in a game. Hmm. I mean, 
where do you find that in the NBA in a situation where a coach will let that happen? Cause he's jumping for everything. And, uh, 20 minutes to me is a fine target for whenever he returns, but we'll learn a lot when he's healthy. We'll learn a lot by Luke Cornett's play. It's a very, very uh, fluid situation, but 20 minutes per game, I think starting in, you know, February, I think that that's absolutely on the board and possible. Kevin Huerter. What's our prediction for him rest of season? Pain. No. <laughs> I don't, he's got that. Uh, he's got the stat set. He's got the skill. He's got the talent. Um, you know, I don't think he's like the next coming of a very good player or anything like that, but he checks a lot of boxes in fantasy leagues. A um, lot of different ways that he could become relevant. And yeah, he does compete a little bit with DeAndre Bembry, who, you know, has that it factor that I think would cut into Huerta's value. Sorry, I got to say it like it's a Hispanic name. Um, he doesn't look but, Hispanic. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. But, you know, that's just how you pronounce it. It's H-U-E, Huerta. Yeah, anyway. Huerta. Oh, there you go, Dan. Sure. Nice. Yeah. I'll let Jackie know that you're you're fully fluent That's now. right. He's from Albany, New York, by the way. <laughs> well see i don't i wouldn't know how to do that you know maybe chef can do that accent who knows yeah we'll get get, um, get the chef in this joint he's, he's from chicago but you know chicago new york same thing a patria could do it patria could do it yeah that's, that's you know you should replace me on this show with a patria um so nah. yeah i i think he's a he's a definitely a luxury stash i think that he's somebody that i, I it's like i want him on my squad there's always somebody a little bit better that that yeah. I can get in, in like a 14 team 200 player deep sort of a situation. So um keep your eye on him if you can afford to stash him. I think you do it. There's a lot I mean when Torian Prince will come back and and make Kevin Werther's stat line look. <laughs> now see this is just mean to Kevin now. I I, I got to stop doing this. I, I need to to find out how it's said. I'll yeah, call up wrong? Rob Braithman and say how do I say this name and I'll say it 50 times in a row. Um yeah, but you know, you got. I, I think you got to try to get him and try to do it. So I'd say like mid January, late January, because I think February, March, and April, he's a guy that will probably be above the top one hundred and fifty and have nice, say, top eighty upside. What's fair back if you were going to trade away Montrez Harrell? Someone, uh, this is VP is upset with the free throw numbers. Tell VP to chill. <laughs> VP, you got to chill a little bit on these free throw numbers here. He's getting it, okay? Um, I think top 50, man. You got to get top 50 back. He's going to be a beast. Like, that team continues to rely on him more and more often. And it's, it's the steals and the blocks and just the score. I mean, it's all there for him. This free throw thing, I think he can get good at it. And so, uh, yeah, top. I wouldn't go anything less than top 50. Hmm. Yeah, he's at number 66 right now, right at the tail end of a pretty big slump for the entire mm-hmm. Clippers team. They were exhausted. They had an awful travel schedule. I tweeted about it last week that they were finally settling in, and now they've been scoring at an absurd clip the last few ball games. I mean, there's, they're putting up these wacko video game numbers, uh, 127, 125, 132, 127, and 127 is their scoring the last five games since they finally got home after like six straight weeks of taking a plane uh, between every single ball game. It was a weird scheduling quirk that I saw somebody note on Twitter, and I looked at it, I was like, yeah, these guys are exhausted, and now they're you know, rolling You know in. who knows about the schedule and always bitches about the schedule? NBA players. <laughs> yeah, it's true. They know they what's going on. Know, they know. They know that the league, This, if you want to try to give a competitive advantage to teams, schedule manipulation, I'm not saying it occurs. I'm just saying this is what players who know stuff, what they say, schedule manipulation is one way to do it. Will the Kings make the playoffs? Man, uh, who asked that question? This is someone named Jack Lindsay. Jack Lindsay, that's a great question. Um, I have to basically own a, a tweet that I, I made, and I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to do it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I have to, is that I said the Kings wouldn't make the playoffs for five years. And, mm. yeah, that's painful, right? Yeah, um, it might be a little shorter than that. Well, I mean, a lot hinges on De'Aaron Fox. Like, 
he has to stay healthy and he's a little, a little, uh, slight of frame. Um, the Kings also have to not be the Kangs and <laughs> we shall that see. is all right. No, know, uh, no more the, hemming and hawing brew. Are they going to make them or not n- this year? Probably not. Yeah. I, I agree, they, actually yeah. this year, this actually these last two weeks, they've played really bad basketball, but where you get the, where you know that they're an emerging team is that they're playing bad basketball and they're still winning games. Yeah. They've had really and good fourth quarters lately. They have this gear that they can hit that teams can't cover because Fox and healed, especially healed healed is the best shooter on this side of Steph Curry and clay Thompson in the league bar none. Like if I needed somebody to make a shot and my life was dependent on it, I'd go Steph clay and then buddy. Um, it, it, when he makes shots, they don't, they're like perfectly centered in the middle of the rim. It's, it's amazing to watch. Um, they, uh, they're not going to make it this year, but if they don't do anything stupid, I, my, my prediction, I, I've already got it teed up. I'm going to tell old takes exposed to laugh at me and, you know, cause I, I think that they just have to not do anything stupid and then they will make the playoffs. Mm. So um, it's a big, big turnaround. And it's also with, you know, Dave Yeager and everything that they've done there. If they, if, if you knew at the beginning of the season that they weren't going to play Zach Randolph at all, I don't make any of those predictions. Like that's a, that's a team that has had playing time issues for years They've they've made bad decisions with playing time. They've given veterans minutes that they shouldn't have done. I and mean, you're seeing it this year with Jaeger and uh, Costa Kufas. They're you know they're still not um, exempt from making those decisions. But uh, beyond that, this is this is a team with an interesting core that has a shot. They just gotta not screw it up. All right, we got about six minutes left on the clock, so uh, I'm going to do a little picking and choosing here. As I told you guys, not all the questions are going to get answered today. They've started coming in here late in the show, so probably not, guys. Apologies if you're posting your question now at like 1235 on the Pacific Coast. It's probably not going to make it, uh, but we're going to do our best here. Um, how do you respond to owners who send you lowball offers constantly? Just reject them. Be the bigger man. Don't do anything crazy. It's not worth your time. Just... Send what are you along. thinking about? Like, I mean, just like, like some show, people showed up in Temecula, like. Well, some people spend a bunch of time like trying to come up with a lowball offer to send back, and then you just get into a, a battle of lowball offers. We got I don't find, even respond. Yeah, just or yeah, that's probably better. Just let it dangle there for a while. That'll really screw you, them because then they can't do it. Out of an offer, I'm just not going to respond. And then there's a, a max in a lot of leagues how many offers you can have out. So if everybody did that to that team, then they just have to stop sending offers or constantly cancel them and send new ones. So let them do all the work, and you just sit back and relax. Frank, me and the Kangs don't talk no more, or possibly until the end of the season, if memory serves. We talked about Kelly Olynyk already. Is Mo Bamba worth a stash? for the chance Orlando continues falling apart and punts on Vucevic at some point. I don't think they're punting on Vuce. Like, Vuce is so central to what they do. It's This isn't the year for Bamba. So I, I would not stash Mo Bamba. I could be wrong on this. Don't, I mean, nobody really knows outside of Vuce's agent and, you know, the, the trade wins. The trade wins, it feels like this could be a good trade deadline year. I've said that the last three years, and I don't think I've been right, so don't listen to me. But They're all fun. I don't know what you're talking about. They're wonderful. They're all we, fun, but I think this one with Anthony Davis being such a big piece, mm. like, I mean, you could see big movement as a result of that. Ah, but well, yeah. we will have our and trade this, deadline coverage, so fear not, I mean, everybody. I, which I'll be suiting up for. That's um, right. Suit up. Mo, Bam- Mo Bamba, no hold. No hold. Mo Bamba's no holds. Uh, can Dennis Smith Jr. hit top 100 or 120 at any point this year? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, this is Luka Doncic's team. Yeah, Luka's the man. Charleston says he thinks I would look good with a beard, so maybe I'll grow one. I've been holding off because I really hated sneezing into a mustache, so I don't, I don't know. I had one, guys. Don't you remember I had a beard last year at this exact moment? I shaved it off like four months ago, and I can't pronounce Dan Vesper too- did have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> only, only you would laugh at that, Dan. I love that, that movie. You. I love that movie. My cousin's in that I, movie. Guys, I, that I, grandma in that movie is my third cousin. May she rest in peace. Francis Bay. 
Happy Gilmore is the you, film. You, you know, I watched that the other day and I was really upset with her. Just she felt like she was entitled to great care at the senior home. <laughs> She's like the first day she was there, she took off her jacket. Can you get me some warm milk, please? Come on. <laughs> I'll get you a warm glass of shit the hell up. Best best Ben Stiller role in any of his movies ever. I don't like Ben Stiller, and he was fantastic in that. Uh, uh, Kyrix. I don't even know how to pronounce his, fa- his first name. Rodions? 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 Uh, mm-hmm. Is he a guy you're grabbing and holding on to to see how this plays out, or is he going to fade once the Nets get healthy? Mm, you know, he, he's got talent, and Crab hasn't gotten it done. Let's just be real. I, I, I think that they're going to you know, pull him back, let Crab have another shot at this. Um, but I think once Crab isn't able to make it work, I think the Curex gets in there and, and, and makes it work. Also, did you see my boy Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Dan Bespris? Yeah, but you can't ignore did- the four clunkers before it. All right, fine. <laughs> take take your take your good points and and, and get out of here. <laughs> he did have a really big game, and he would made made my tweet storm as a guy that I'd be watching in the next one. It was also like triple overtime, though, right? Double overtime. I love the when we disagree on a player. I it's know, so, it's rare. so rare. I just it's can't. Like, I gotta just you know relish these moments. I know. Even if even if you win and I'm wrong, like you know, it's I, fun. We, it's we good have like radio. Three of these a year. Who's the other? Who's the other ones? We no, got? I think it's just that. I think it's one. Is that? <laughs> I think it's the only one. I honestly don't All know right, anybody well, else. Let's make it a fight. Yeah, I'll take you. I'll take you down over Rondé Hollis Jefferson. I had him for that two for thirteen from the field and one for six at the foul line, and I'll never forgive him for that one game. <laughs> that, it's done. Dude, bad things happen. Uh huh. He's done. He's he's dead to me. He's done. Uh, done with you, Rondé. Let's see. Let me find the best questions here. Like I said, not everyone is getting answered. If you got like a six player rank fest that's not getting in there, if you got a trade offer on the table, take it to the hoop ball forums, guys. This is for the big stuff. Uh Torian Prince, this is a good question. What do you think he could do when he comes back? Top one hundred, top ninety, top one twenty five. Where are you sticking him? Top 40, I don't know, I go top 50 and eight cat and top 60 and nine cat. Ah, I excellent. Mean, yeah, I don't see any reason why he doesn't pick up right where he left off. If anything, he gets to see the game, learn the game, you know, work on other aspects of the game. You know, they, he's he's going to be fine. Um, they will also, theor- I mean, the big talk is Kent Bazemore, you know, are they going to be able to trade him? I'm not worried about that from a Bazemore perspective. I'll let that stuff play out. Unless you're in a playoff format, then you might want to make a move while the going is good. Great HB6 selection, by the way, if I don't mean to toot my own horn. Um, but if that was to happen, then Prince is literally just unstoppable, you know, for this team. Adyant says, then you guys could call me Dan Beardbris if I had a uh, beard once again. I <laughs> Had to, had to get that one here before the show wrapped up. That uh, was important, Dan. I don't was... want to hear anything about my long responses <laughs> after that. That was, I took eight seconds for that one. All right, last question of the day, and I got to try to make sure it's the one that I wasn't the even most a people. question. No, it wasn't, but it was funny, so it's going in. Uh, are you at all concerned about Eric Bledsoe's lower usage rate lately? That's not that hard of one, but you know I'm. Who, whoever asked that question, give them some dap. That, that's a great, great item I was looking at with the George Hill stuff. George Hill is getting time. It's not cutting into their playing time. You know, they being Eric Bledsoe, they being Malcolm Brogdon, all those guys are getting big minutes. They're playing these very guardy sort of lineups, but usage, you you wouldn't think that George Hill would impact it, but you know, it's just a little bit more ball handling. That's not in Eric Bledsoe's hands. It's something to watch. I don't think it's going to do anything but hit him by like 10 slots, 10, 20 slots, mm-hmm. something like that. But it's something to watch. It's a very nuanced observation by the question asker there. Very good. Uh, also, quick shout out to Chris Middleton for finally hitting more than 22% of his shots. Ooh, I'm for glad a game. you brought his name up. Bye. Yeah. Low. Do it quick. I mean, he, he, like, this is a guy that cannot, his, his stats for three years have been so predictable. Mm hmm. You, Get a buy low better than this. Yep. So just get in there and get in there and do it. Get in there and do it. He's Aaron Brewski. I'm Dan Bespris. This is Fantasy NBA Today live on Friday. Brew, have a magical weekend. Uh, I I think I'm talking to you before the new year anyway. But if I don't, happy new year and to everybody out there listening and watching. Thanks as always. 
Get yourself some coffee at H.I. Kona Coffee on Twitter, Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company, and follow everybody. Play in our DFS game. That's the last thing I'm going to say on today's show. Uh, that's how I'm closing it out. Join the DFS contest. Turn, turn three bucks into 30. It's the best way to do it watching basketball. Turn three bucks into 30. The tweet is sent. The tweets will continue to be sent. Again, have a marvelous weekend. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy New Year if you don't catch up with us, but we'll be back with you on Monday anyway. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.